Well, good morning to e each and every one of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you here on this day. Today, we are not enjoying the benefit that the psalmist spoke about. The psalmist said, I rejoiced when they told me, let us, let us go into the house of the Lord. Uh, all of you who are watching this at home, you guys are not enjoying that privilege on this day. And we are, we are sad about that. We are also sad with the fact that we are not recording this, that we are not um, engaging in public worship on the Lord's Day. We can engage indeed, and we should, and we must engage in private worship on the Lord's Day. And you should do, you should do this right now. Uh, for us who are here, we can enjoy this, this moment, but it is not on our favorite day of the week to do that. Uh, but I, I, give, I thank God for the opportunity to record the, the, the service. It will be an entire service. I have, I'm not alone. I have two, two people with me. So uh, biblical theology teaches us that the, the amount of people for public worship, it's not determined by, by numbers. It doesn't need to be 300, 500 people. In fact, if you have two or more, it's already enough to be a public, a public event, a public worship. So having said that, let us begin the public worship of our Lord. Let us take one minute to pray. Let us pray silently and individually. At home, please pray as we begin uh, watching this video. Let us ask the Lord to bless us. Today we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter uh, 24. We will continue from where we stopped three weeks ago. Let us pray. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps truth forever and never forsake the work of his hands. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, let us begin this public worship service end this recording by singing, uh, not singing, by reading Psalm number 107. Let us read Psalm number 107. Uh, I will be reading from the Psalter. Uh, if you don't have one at home, I'm, I would imagine that almost nobody would have one at home. You can find it online. You can download an app on your phone. There are apps for this. Uh, or you can just read on your regular Bible as well, of course. So I'll be reading Psalm number 107 from verse 1 until verse 7. Praise God, for he is good, for still his mercies lasting be. Let God's redeemed say so, whom he from the enemy's hand did free. And gather them out of the lands from north, south, east, and west, they strayed in desert's path, pathless way, no city found to rest. For thirst and hunger in them thanks, their soul, then straits, when straits them press, they cry unto the Lord and he, them frees from their distress. Them also in a way to walk, that right is he, is he the, did guide, that they might to a city go wherein they might abide. Amen. Amen. Let us, let us come before the Lord in prayer at this moment. Let us pray all together at this moment. 
Blessed be your name, almighty God, for your good and kind and most gracious and most wonderful. O oh Lord, we give thanks for the privilege we have of coming before you at this hour and coming before you also on the Lord's Day in the privacy of our homes. O oh Lord, we, we give thanks for your people can go through this trying time indeed with the suspension of the public service, but upholding the private service. Thank you, Lord, for we can indeed worship you. You do not forsake your people. You shall never forsake your people. And your people, Lord, will always be able to worship you. Whether we're missing our tongues, our eyes, our hands, whether we're missing each other even, whether we're missing whatever it may be, for as long as there is breath, for as long as there is a mind, we can still worship you, O Lord. And we remember the words of Jesus that the time has come and it is, it is with us. We are true worshipers. When true worshipers will worship in truth, in spirit, like you command, O Lord. O Lord, may, may this worship be in spirit and in truth, as you deserve it. For your God above all gods, your kindness above all kindness, your greatness above all greatness. So Lord, bless us at this hour. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for all the Bible-believing and Bible-professing churches in this world. Prosper your people, Lord. In times of difficulty, your people may rise up. We must rise up and be faithful and be strong. Oh, Lord, keep your people strong at this time. Keep your people safe from this virus, from evil, from accidents, from calamities. Protect your people, Lord, and cause your people to move forward in faith, to endure this period. And Lord, bring us back together. Bring us back together, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray for the governors, the mayors, the president, that they may see and that they may guide, they may lead the nation with godliness, with righteousness. Oh Lord, the Bible told, told us to, to pray for our, our leaders, for our governors. We pray for them, O oh Lord. We pray for them. Bless them indeed, O oh Lord. Bless them indeed. So that we, we may enjoy peace and prosperity. Oh Lord, we pray for those of our congregation, those near to us that are sick, that are going through illness. Oh Lord, we pray for those who are far away. We pray for, for G.A. And, and, and Sarah and Samuel Strip. God willing, this coming Tuesday. Pray that they may come back well. We pray for the seminaries that are connected to our church. May many blessings be upon them. Lord, may they, may they be blessed and carried through this difficult period as well. And Lord, at this hour, we pray your many blessings upon this, this service, upon this sermon. May we, Lord, may we understand the text, may we believe the text, and may we live what you have for us that is displayed on this text. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us, let us read again. Let us read Psalm number 35. Let us go back to Psalm number 35. Not go back, forgive me. Let us go to Psalm number 35, verse 1 until verse 5. Psalm number 35, verse 1 until verse 5. I shall read these verses. Plead, Lord, with those that plead and fight, with those that fight with me, of shield and buckler take thou hold. Stand up, mine help to be. Draw also out the spear, and do against them stop the way, that me pursue unto my soul. I am thy salvation, say. 
Let them confounded be and shamed that for my soul have sought. Who plot my hurt turned back be they, turned back be they into confusion brought. Let them be like unto the chef that flies before the wind. And let the angel of the Lord pursue them hard behind. Amen. Let us now go to Genesis. So let us open our Bibles. Please, at home, open your Bibles as well. Please have your Bible in front of you throughout this entire uh, sermon. Genesis chapter 24. This is the second sermon on this chapter. I will continue from where we stopped. It is quite a long chapter. It is a chapter with 20, 67, 67 verses. Uh, I will continue from verse 22, from the 22nd verse uh, until the end of this, the chapter because I believe I will be able to conclude this chapter on this day. So I shall read Genesis chapter 24, uh, verse 22 until verse 67. Just as a quick uh, reminder, on the beginning of the chapter, we saw Abraham calling his eldest uh, and most important uh, servant, commanding him to go back to Ur of the Chaldeans, which is where Abraham came from, to the house of his uh, relatives. And he commands his servant to take, uh, to find their uh, wife for his son Isaac. He commands him to be careful that he doesn't take his son there, but that the lady come to be with him. Uh, Isaac, as you may remember, as I said on the last sermon, two sermons ago, Isaac was the only patriarch that never actually left the land of uh, the promised land. And then uh, as the servant arrives on the land, he prays to the Lord. And before he's done praying, the Lord is already answering his request. He asked the Lord, the Lord, the lady to whom I shall ask for water, will not only give me water, but also give water to all my camels. And as you may remember from this sermon before, this was a mighty task to give water to 10 camels. The text specifically mentions that he had 10 camels. So by my calculations, she worked hard for two or three hours by the time she was done. She was most likely covered in sweat. And for sure, she was a very strong lady with a good back, very good knees, and a fantastic uh, willingness, a fantastic, fantastic willingness to uh, work and help others, specifically, pe particularly people that she doesn't know. So we see that this Abraham, uh, Abraham servant watched until the end. And now we come to verse 22. And so we read. So it was when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a golden nose ring, weighing half a shekel, and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels of gold. And said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? So she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Michael, 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 forgive me, I'll start the verse again. So she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to Nahor. Moreover, she said to him, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. Then the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man by the well. So it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebekah, saying, Thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man, and where he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Then the man came to the house, and he unloaded the camels. 
and provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. And he said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. And you shall take a wife for my son from my family and from my father's house. You will be clear from this oath when you arrive among my family, for if they will not give her to you, then you will be released from my oath. And this day I came to the well and said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water. And it shall come to pass that when the virgin, come, the virgin comes out to draw water, and I say to her, Please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. But before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebekah coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, Please let me drink. And she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels a drink also. Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham who had led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard the words that that he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold and clothing and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her, to her brother and to her mother. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose in the morning and said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least ten. After that she may go. And he said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said, We will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands. And may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the men. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac came from the way of Beer Be'er Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field this, this evening. And he lifted his eyes and looked. And there the camels were coming. Then Rebekah lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel. For she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? 
The servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah and she became his wife. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So far the reading of the word of the Lord. Let us now go, go back to Psalm number 35. Let us go to Psalm number 35. Let us go from verse 6 until verse 10. Psalm number 35, verse 6 to verse 10. And so it says the Psalm of our Lord. With darkness cover thou their way, and let us sleep reprove, and let the angel of the Lord pursue them from above. For without cause have they for me their net hid in a pit. They also have without a cause, for my soul digged it. Let ruin seize him unawares, his net he hid without. Himself let catch, and in the same destruction let him fall. My soul in God shall joy, and glad in his salvation be. And all my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like unto thee? Which does the poor set free from him that is for him too strong? The poor and needy from the man that spoils and does him wrong. So far, the singing, so to speak, the reading of God's psalm. Let us go back to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. As I mentioned before, this is the second psalm, the second, forgive me, the second sermon on this passage. And we have gone, we have seen so far that Abraham commanded his servant to find him a wife. She must come here, he cannot go there. And Abraham's servant would be dismissed from his oath if the lady would refuse to come. And Abraham's servant asked God for a sign. God, whoever, allow, whoever is willing to feed my, to, to, to water my camels, not only me, but not, to, not only to give water to me, but also to my camels, let that lady be the one that you have chosen. And then we see that Abraham, Abraham's servant, which I believe was the one called Eliezer, on verse 21, he observed until the end to see if the Lord would make his journey prosperous. But then we see in verse 22 that after they were done, that, she took, that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing 10 shekels of gold. We're talking about one third of a pound of gold. So that's a very, very generous gift. Now, I am noticing here that we see here the mention of a nose ring. And forgive me, but I will insist on this matter. And I will open a parenthesis here on this sermon. I don't know about you, but I have heard plenty of Christians saying that, uh, I, I very much dislike this, but here's what I hear. Here's what I hear. Uh, that body piercings are something from the devil. A lot of Christians, they say, uh, nose rings are not things that Christians should wear. Guys, I particularly abhor nose rings. I think they're very ugly. But that's my private personal opinion. My, my personal opinion. My problem is when Christians say that other Christians cannot on moral grounds have this kind of thing. That, then I have a problem. Because we see here on this text that Abraham's servant was taking this a nose ring as a gift. Another matter that bothers me immensely on the behavior of many Christians is that many of them are opposing makeup, for example, or wearing jewelry, and they, they give a, a spiritual reason. And they even quote you scripture. The Bible says that the beauty of the ladies should not be gold or, 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 or external, the external, but the, the beauty of a godly woman should come from inside. Well, all nice and fine, but if Abraham, who, is, who was a very godly man, would allow his servant to take this kind of gifts, and by the way, if that's something that's not from God, 
why did Abraham have it on the first place? And not, but you may be thinking, Felipe, Abraham, it is not the standard for everything. Good point, fair point. Now, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, we have God describing Israel as a little girl that when he found she was completely uh, left to her own devices and impoverished and about to die. And the, God himself compares his care for the nation of Israel as, his, as, his, as a care of a, of a father that adopts a girl that was found on the wayside about to die with poor nutrition, so to speak. So the Bible says that God took that little girl, fed her, cared for her, cleaned her, she grew, and the Bible says that God gave her uh, gold to make herself look good. And the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 16 that God himself put a nose ring on the, do on the nose of that, little, of that not, not little girl anymore, but she grew and became an adult. Now, if the Bible is showing God doing that, of course, that's a comparison. That is a story to illustrate that a father that does this to a daughter is not doing anything wrong. Is actually do, is showing his love. Is giving her something that she would look even prettier. So be very careful. I remember a Christian rebuking me. One day a Christian saw that my two little girls had earrings. And he looked at me and said, Why are you infusing vanity in the hearts of your daughters? Now, now, you see, I'm not saying that you, I'm not saying that you gotta give and put this and this on your daughter or your son. That's not my point. Once again, I'm particularly, I'm more traditional. I, I kind of like less. But that's my personal preference. Be very careful when you as a Christian want to tell the people what to do based on your preference. See, your preference is not the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. So if you're opposing a matter on priv with, for private reasons, you state, I particularly don't like it. So, and you say, you don't like it. Not that it's wrong. If you say this is wrong, you're saying that there is a moral ground for somebody to oppose it. No, and there is none. There are none. Now, I find it also interesting that some people that say that they oppose body piercing, well, I wonder if they re don't realize that their ears are actually part of their body. So, uh, anyways, that's a long parenthesis. I want to continue with the text. But nevertheless, important, if you, if you go about telling people, oh, you cannot put on makeup, you cannot put on gold on your hair, and you cannot wear a bracelet or a necklace, or you cannot, and guys, those things are costly. Some Christians say, oh, Christians should not spend a lot on their clothing. Once again, those are expensive things that God himself was giving to his daughter. In this case, Israel. So be very careful when you make statements like this. You may be, you may be actually saying that God made a mistake on his, met, on his metaphor. But nevertheless, let us continue. We see on verse 23 and verse 20, from verse 23 to 25 that that Eliezer, which I suppose is the one, it's the name of the servant, uh, he was looking for a place to lodge and the possibility to also meet the lady's, uh, the, this lady's father. So he asked about room and, uh, and then he's overwhelmingly happy with the reply. The lady tells him, Rebecca tells him, yes, there is, there is hay, there is, there is feed, there is, we have all that you need. You can come, you have a place to stay, please come and stay in my father's house. Yet again, a very lovely lady that is quite eager to help somebody that she never met in her life. Now, we see in verse 26, the, the worshipful response of Abraham's servant. Then the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Now, observe here the way in which he's showing his worship. He's just bowing his head. That, that's all he's doing here. I'm making a point here, and this will become clearer 
as we go on with the sermon towards, I think, verse 50 or something like that. Um, but we see here that he worships the Lord then and there. In a public place, he worships the Lord by bowing his head and saying, Lord, thank you for taking my trip in good terms, for giving me victory and giving me success in my endeavor, in my errand. And now observe that the way, the words that he used are quite telling. Look at verse 27. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. The word here, mercy, I've mentioned this before, is the Hebrew word has said. Has said is covenantal faithfulness. That's what the word means. Sometimes the King James or the New King James translates as covenantal or everlasting, uh, not covenantal, forgive me, uh, mercy or everlasting mercy or the, the, there are multiple translations. But what the word essentially means is covenantal faithfulness, a faithfulness that exists because of the covenant that was made. Now, I find this quite interesting. In Eliezer's understanding, and he's rightly thinking so, this had covenantal implications. Because on the covenant, God promised Abraham, I'll make you great, I will multiply you, your children who will come from your body will multiply immensely. Well, of course, his son needed a wife, obviously. There's no doubt about that. Otherwise, it would not be possible. So Eliezer is looking at what's happening right now at that moment. And he's saying, what is taking place right now is the mercy of God being displayed through this situation. Now, observe this, guys. God did not show up there, did he? Do we see God appearing here? Do we see an angel? Do we see a prophet? We see nothing like that. Nevertheless, he is saying, through these natural circumstances, this commonplace story, God is fulfilling his promise. Why am I saying this? Do not make the mistake of thinking that God is active only when something fantastic to your eyes take place. Nothing supernatural happened here. Yeah. Rebecca worked her head off and she was quite sweat. But that's all natural. Watering the camels, natural. Being thirsty, natural. Arriving from a long trip, natural. Abraham's demand that Eliezer vows to him, natural. All natural. All natural. Nevertheless, God was perfectly active. And Eliezer recognized what took, what, what took place here right now is God's display of covenantal faithfulness. What a, what a wonderful story. What an encouragement for us Christians. What an encouragement. Now, we have a virus on our midst now. That's a natural event. We wish it wouldn't, but it's actually natural. On this natural world, naturally fallen world, where viruses are found, what we have right now is a natural event. Is God speaking to us through this situation? You betcha. You betcha. You can be sure of it. God spoke through an event that particularly affected directly only that lady and that servant. And the other nine, I mean, I don't know how many exactly. They had ten camels, I don't know how many people total. But Eliezer and the other servants and the lady. I mean, the sphere of influence, tiny. Yet this had implications for billions of Christians throughout the ages. So is God speaking to us through a virus today? Yes. And the message is pretty simple. Repent. Repent for we do not know when our last day will be. Repent for we do not know when our last breath will take place. I don't know how many people have died so far, but let me tell this. Way more die on traffic, on, traffic, uh, on, um, on car accidents. Way more. I think what dies on a day 
It's more than all the victims of the virus so far. On a day, on a day. So, and you, you drive. I'm sure you guys, if you're not the one driving, you're on the passenger seat, or you are on the bus, or on the train, or on the airplane. We do not know when we shall breathe our last. So learn to see God through the natural events. Learn to observe, learn how to read God's actions through natural events. And on the end of the day, remember that God's love for Abraham was not greater, not smaller than God's love for each and every individual born-again Christian today. Now, we read the story and we think, we know, Abraham is a big deal. Let's agree, you and I. He's a big deal. Isaac, big deal. Rebecca, another big deal. But on the end of the day, they were targets of God's love on the same way that a born-again Christian is a target of God's love today. So in the same manner that God was interested in, in speaking to them at that time, God is interested in speaking to you and I today. So in verse 28, the woman ran, the young lady ran. Rebecca heard the name Abraham. And it's, Eliezer was praying, oh God, thank you for your, your has said, your, your covenantal faithfulness towards my master Abraham. Rebecca hears that, and she, I believe, I think I have... Freedom to say that. She recognized that name. She knew who Nahor was, of course. That's her own ancestor. And most likely she knew that Abraham was Nahor's brother. So she ran. She ran immediately, told the people in her household, here's what happened, here are the gifts. Laban, the father, the mother, Laban, which is Rebecca's, who is Rebecca's brother, saw the nose ring, saw the, 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 the bracelets, thank you very much, saw the bracelets, so she was already wearing them. I can imagine Eliezer being quite bold, going and putting, the Bible says that he put the bracelets on her, on her wrists, and the, the, the nose ring on her nose. Uh, of course, he was not putting for the first time, most likely he was just replacing another one that was already there. Like simple as changing an earring. So he, he did that. And she ran impressed. My goodness, this man is not only giving me these amazing gifts, he's quoting Abraham, he's mentioning Abraham. So he goes and ran and tell them the good news. This guy is talking about Abraham, yeah, our uncle. Now Eliezer ran. Eliezer, no, not Eliezer, forgive me. Uh, Laban. Laban immediately ran. Now, we have here some observations to make. Observe that her father, Rebecca's father, seems to be quite passive. We see here that uh, the ones that are most active, take verse 28, for example. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. Her mother's household. Well, her father was alive. We see her father on the text. I think on verse, um, verse 50, Bethuel. So he was perfectly alive and well and making decisions. But apparently he was more of, or he was sick, or he was unable to make decisions, or he was a very passive man that did not take leadership of his own house and allowed his wife and his son to run the house on his behalf, which is not the appropriate thing to do, biblically speaking, at all. Unless if one is sick and cannot physically take the task, then of course, there is no problem. But we see that Laban ran, but not, not out of a good heart, not out of a burning desire to, to meet the servant of his uncle. He ran after he saw the good stuff, after he saw the gold. And we see later on in the Bible, particularly with, by the way that he treated Jacob, that he was a, a lover of gold. His deal was the money. And observe verse 29 until verse 31, the language that he uses. You know when people, when, they, when their politeness is actually over the top and it sounds like way too much. Look at, look at um, verse, 
Verse 31. The, for, the, the for verse number 31. And he said, come in. Laban is speaking to Eliezer. Come in, O blessed of the Lord. How? He doesn't know him. Imagine somebody comes to you, you have no idea who you are. Heard the story. But come to you and say, oh, blessed of the Lord. I mean, how can they be sure that you are actually a blessed man of God? So I find it over the top. Now look, look at what else he says. Why do you stand outside? Oh, of course. He doesn't live there, of course. He had to wait outside. For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. No, he had not. That's a lie. The Bible says that he saw Rebecca, he heard Rebecca's speech, saw the bracelet, saw the nose ring, thought this guy has plenty of money. So he saw those things and he ran. When did he prepare the house? Now, if the house was already prepared, he could have said, We have a place. We already have a place prepared. You can even say prepared for you. But he said, I have prepared the house. No, you have not. You just heard I arrived. Which time did you take? So we see that his selection of words sounds way too flattery. Way too, way over the top. Let's put it that way. Now in verse 32, 32 and 33, the entire um, entourage, the, the entire group, uh, Eliezer and all his men arrive inside the house. They, they are well lodged. They put the animals on a proper place. And they sit before the table and they are about to eat. And Eliezer says something quite interesting. Eliezer says, I'm not going to eat until I let you guys know why I'm here. Guys, I don't know, I don't know if you guys know this, but for the culture, we, we're making this comparison based on what we know of the culture of the Near East at that time, which is in many ways, quite similar to the culture of the Near East until today. You never go straight to business. You never do that. Now, for an American audience, this sounds quite simple. Because Americans, they go straight to business. On the Near East, no. First you see, you sit down, you eat. After you have talked a while, sometimes an hour or two, you got to know each other. Then you say, look, I want to talk to you about something. So it's a very roundabout way of doing things. It is, imagine the Brazilian culture multiplied by four. You, know, you take a while until you actually get to the topic. What this man is doing here, it is borderline disrespectful. I'm not saying he is being disrespectful. I'm saying... It is borderline disrespectful because that's not how the culture goes. Uh, and being a wise man, being a man from that region, remember, this is Abraham's oldest servant. Most likely, no, it's, almost, it's basically for sure that this man left Ur of the Chaldeans with Abraham. So he knew the local culture very well. Very well. And yet he says, I must I must break protocol because the matter is that urgent. So, he con so they, they allow him, they say, speak on, and he continues. And then he gives us the entire narrative, yet again. For us again, for the people at that time, they were, they were listening for the first time. And we see that he's a very wise man in his selection. He leaves something, some things out, he emphasizes other things. Oh, through and through, a very wise man, a very wise man. And he drives home a few, a few points that are quite key for him. Number one, my master have been blessed by God immensely. Now, it may look like he's saying, we are rich, you should be with us. It is not shallow like that. If you would be on his shoes. You would really want to convey to the other family that this lady will be looked after. Well, I'll take an experience from my own family. Uh, when I, I married a Korean, my, 
my parent, my the parents of my my in-laws, the parent, the parents of my wife. Um, when we were getting married, my father and my mom went to Korea with me. We got married in Korea, and then we got married again in Brazil. And my father asked for somebody to translate him, and on a private setting, he told my father-in-law, and he said, "Make be be assured that we will take care." of your daughter. I know that we are, she, your daughter is going to the other side of the planet to be married to a family that you guys don't know. So I can imagine you guys are quite concerned to see your daughter go so far away. I want to assure you that your daughter will be well looked after. And my wife and I, we were not thinking about this because we were, we were confident with each other. But when my father-in-law heard that, he said, he told my father, your words mean a lot to us. I highly, I highly appreciate your, your statement. My, the grandmother of my wife actually made a funny, funny comment. She, she was almost crying telling my father, and my father doesn't speak Korean, and neither her, and speak, neither she speaks Portuguese. And she was almost crying saying, if my granddaughter does anything wrong, it's my fault. Please don't blame her. <laughs> This is, pe people are concerned. People are concerned on these situations. So what, what Eliezer wanted to drive home is, we will care for her. If you allow her to come with us, she will be well looked after. She will lack nothing. Very wise man. If I'm the father, if I'm Bethuel, I want to hear those things. I, I, those are not the only things I want to hear. But those are among the things that I very much want to hear. And then he also brings the divine element. He says, I asked the Lord for a sign. And I was not even done asking. And God was answering. Like that. Well, it was not even like that. It was before that. I was not done. And the reply came. So that gives the idea that God is really blessing the matter. Really, more than the natural. Because it is common for us to ask God for things and wait until he replies. If he ever grants us what we are asking. But he's saying here, I was not done asking and I was receiving God's reply. So your daughter will be well looked after and we have God's blessing on the matter. And now we come to verse 49. Verse 49. After he tells the whole story again, we come to the most important verse in the entire, verse, in the entire chapter. Will you guys allow her to come? That's the high point. All of that would have been for nothing. If Bethuel and his wife would have said, no. Turn around. See you never. It, it would have been a big problem. He could not kidnap her. So it would have been a big problem. Now we see here that he asks them the question. Now observe this. We, he knew, he had, he had confidence that God was in the matter. And yet he did not push it. He did not come and say, you guys got to allow me to take her. Because otherwise you're disobeying God. This is God's will. You have to do it. Many people do that nowadays. They come to you, they tell you a story. Or they say, God told me. So you have to do that. He, he actually, he didn't say God told me. But he said, God blessed my trip. Will you guys bless me as well? Observe the humbleness of the man. Very different than many, many people today. Quite different. Very different. Humble to the end. And now we see the reply. Also quite interesting. Look at this. Then verse 50 and 51. Then Laban and Bethel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. So both men are saying, 
we cannot go against what you're saying. We cannot say we cannot we cannot say this is good or this is bad. It comes from God. It it's beyond the matter of should we should we say yes or should we say no? It's beyond that. This comes from the Lord. They were simply saying, we acknowledge God's hand in your narrative. Your narrative convinced us that God is with you. We are, we are, we are convinced of that. So we are not going to say anything bad or anything good. We will simply acknowledge that God is with you. Which on the end of the day, it is something quite good. And then continuing, it says, Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go. And let her be your master's son's wife. As the Lord has spoken. That's the interesting part here. Did God speak? Did God speak? Did you see any prophet? Any angel? Voice from heaven? Nothing. God did not say a thing. And they're saying, do it as the Lord has spoken. What's the point here? These men observed that God was speaking through natural events. What I said a few minutes ago, we have to be able to learn. We must, we must learn how to see God in daily life. That, that takes time. That takes time. That takes a lot of Christian maturity. That will, will be mistaken many times. Sometimes we'll think God is, in, is with us on the matter. How many people pray, saying, God, give me a girlfriend, and then they have a girlfriend? And by the way, that's a very good thing for a, a young man that intends to get married should be praying about. That's a very good thing, man or woman. And they pray and they pray and then they finally get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And then it goes horribly wrong. And they break up and it was one of the worst experiences of their lives. Where was God? I don't intend to answer particularly that question on this sermon. That, that, would take me, that takes a lot. We've got to go case by case. But the point is these men were so convinced that God was speaking, and he was, through natural events, which was the case. And they were so convinced of that, that for them, if a voice would have come from heaven, it would carry the same weight. Because they said, God spoke. No, he didn't. Well, but he did. But he did. And now, comes this wonderful reply from Eliezer. Look at this. Remember that I said a few minutes, a few verses ago that Eliezer, when Rebecca told her that she had a place to stay and her father was Bethuel, and the, he, would be, he and his uh, committee would be welcome to come into the house, Eliezer bowed his head and worshiped God. Now look at what he does now. Verse 52. He worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Now before he was just doing this. And now he's causing his forehead to touch the ground. All the way down. All the way down. He's bowing himself all the way to the floor. Why? Why, why the difference? Observe that we healthy humans, they have a connection between what's going on inside and, what's, and what the body is doing. It is a sign. You know the people that they cannot hide if they are upset or sad? That's actually a virtue. They do not have the practice of being two-faced. They... Their actions, of course, it's time and place for everything. I'm not denying that, of course. But observe that this man was so overjoyed that he broke protocol. You are at the table. That's not for the place for you to step out of the chair. 
I don't know if they have chairs. I imagine that they had lower tables with big, bigger pillows where people would lay sideways, as is the custom until today in many countries in the Near East, which, by the way, is a far better way to eat, but that's a subject for another time, and that's not really theological. So he goes, he breaks protocol and bows all the way to the ground and he starts praising God. There is a time and place for everything. And this man here was breaking protocol to praise God. For he saw the wonderful providence of the Lord. I want to ask you this. Do people around you know that you pray? I'm not trying, saying that you should show off your prayers, no. But I observe that some people, they have lived, they have their families and they grow up, and they have never heard the voice of another person praying even. Some children, some, pa some parents have never prayed out loud with their children. Some grandparents have never given their grand grandchildren the privilege of hearing them praying. Now, here's a, a man on a different house, on the house of somebody else, and he's bowing all the way to the floor in order to show everybody how overjoyed he is and how thankful to God he is. Of course, he shows later on by giving gifts the, 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 his joy towards those people there. But first, he shows his joy to God. Do, do people in your house, do they know how your prayers sound like? Have people in your own household heard you praying? Don't, don't, don't be one of those that no, nobody heard you pray. That we are, I find this even, happening even among Christians. They, they tend to, to take their faith such privately. And of course, there is, aspect, there is an aspect of prayer that of our faith that is private. But faith, it's a, by and large a public matter. If I look at you and I, and I observe your behavior and I live with you and I cannot tell that you are a Christian, well, lo and behold, maybe you're not. Maybe you're not. Why Christians suffered so much in the past? Even though they were going through persecution. It's because the behavior of a Christian is very difficult to hide. So they were identified as Christians even when they were trying to hide it. Which they should which they should, but even so, they were identified. Those people, they, they're different. What's up with them? And they were discovered to be Christians. And they died because of that. Because you see, a healthy Christian have a good connection between the inner person and the body behavior. Between the soul and the actions of the body. There is no divorce. A healthy person doesn't divorce these areas. Now, we continue here with the gifts, the dowry. I believe this is a dowry payment that he gives gifts to Rebecca even more and he gives gifts to the family. Now, why, why dowries? And are dowries evil in themselves? I have plenty of reasons to dislike dowries. I, 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 don't, I dislike them fervently, fervently. But it is a practice that is done in many countries in the world nowadays, and there is a logic in it. I don't understand some countries that, you see, you have countries that they pay dowries to the family receiving the lady, and you have countries that they pay dowries to the family that is giving the lady. So I don't understand the logic in all scenarios. But on this case here, I understand the logic. The dowry is basically a payment, a reimbursement. Not, they're not buying a human being. That's not the point here. But they acknowledge that it was costly to raise that human being. And now that that human being, that person is an adult, is productive, can work, can help everybody else to think. Now that uh, uh, there will be a financial return, not that you are raising people for the sake of making money. That's not the point. But it is true that there will be a financial return whether that was the, the, the intended purpose or not. So the dowry is, here's a reimbursement for all the years, effort that you put into raising this person, into turning this person into what this person is today. So we reimburse you, 
and we will reap the fruits of having this person with us. We will enjoy her wisdom. We enjoy her, her work. We enjoy her laughter in the house. It is one greater addition to our family. Meanwhile, your family is having one less. So I get the logic in this scenario. I don't think I like, I, I, I don't particularly like it. Maybe it's because I live in the 21st century. Maybe if I was born 300 years or 3,000 years ago, maybe I would have a very different outlook on the matter. But I don't think we can, we can say, oh, the hope, the practice is downright sinful. I, I'm reticent. I'm reticent in, in making this, in this statement. And we continue here, and it comes the day of their departure. Actually, not the day of the departure. The next day, they ate, they were happy, they had a party, sleep, wake up, and the man says, let me go. Let us go. And then they reply, now, if we just read the text, barely, straightforward, read the text, our understanding would be, wow, it looks like he woke up on the next day and said, okay, Rebecca, top of the camel. Bye, everybody. Let's go. Guys, the matter was not that fast. Rebecca would most likely, and I believe that was the case, never see her mom again, never see her dad again, never see her brother again, ever, ever, ever. It would be as if she would be dying. They didn't have cheap air, airplane tickets at that time. Neither airplane, let alone cheap. No cars, no good roads. A trip for, uh, from out of the Chaldeans all the way to Israel, particularly at that time, particularly with ladies present on the convoy, would take a long time with good roads, which I'm not sure they had. Maybe they did, maybe they, did, maybe they didn't. I'm more inclined to think they didn't. So it would be as if that person would be dying. Whenever the person actually died, maybe they're not even hear of the person's death, or hear a year later, or 10 years later. So by our intents and purposes, he was goodbye for good. For good. So he asks, let us go. And the reply on verse 55, it's, I want you to be a bit, I want you to follow me here. And let us give a little room for interpretation on this verse. Let the young woman stay with us a few days. Observe in your Bible that a few uh, is actually in italics. That means that it's an added it's added in order to make the translation smooth. In the Hebrew, what is actually written here is, let the lady stay with us days, at least then. Now, stay with us days, depending on the situation, it can actually mean a year. And the 10, and it doesn't say at least 10 days, it says at least 10. Let the lady stay with us days, at least then. So what can actually be said here, I cannot prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt, but the text would allow for such interpretation that what they mean here is actually, let the lady stay with us a year, or at least 10, in this case, months. And then you may go. Which, if I hear that I'm never going to see my daughter again, yeah, you think it's quite a reasonable request. Give us a year to say goodbye. We'll never see her again. Doesn't sound... Now, if you take it, the literal case here, let the lady stay with us 10 days, and Eliezer saying, no, we want to go now. Now, imagine if you are a servant, and you're, and you're getting a daughter for... Uh, uh, daughter-in-law for your master and you refuse to take one day now imagine you if you are a liaison and tell the family nope, nope, sorry, no can do we gotta go now you're never gonna see her again you better say goodbye because the camels are about to stand up 
it, it, it would sound like the most insensitive action of all. It could actually cause them to, to say, you know what? You go, you go back. You go back. Here's your gifts. Rebecca, take those, that nose ring. Give back. Go. In fact, it may be that they actually thought that. You know what? You don't want to give us time enough to say goodbye? Let's undo the whole matter. Because they actually said, you know what? Not you don't decide it, or we don't decide it. Let Rebecca decide it. And she said, I will go. Now, when we read it, it looks like she said, no, I'm going to go. Mom, Daddy, kiss for you, kiss for you. My brother, a kiss for you. There I go. Which one is my camel? It was not like that. It would still take a few days for her to gather all her belongings. It said that her maid went with her. And on verse 61, it said her maids, plural. Her nurse on verse um, 59, and on verse 61, her maid. So a whole lot of people had to get ready. Guys, that takes some time. They didn't have a truck that you can take all your house and put on a truck in one day. You got to pack and pack well, pack nicely. This will go on top of camels' backs. Those things can break. So you got to think well through what you're going to take for a three months or five months or six months trip, however long it took. Or I don't know, maybe if they were super fast a month. I don't think it was that fast at all. It, it was a matter that took a few days still. But nevertheless, observe Rebecca's willingness. And she said, I will go. Does that remind you of somebody? It reminds me of Abraham. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, leave your house, leave your family, and go to a land you don't know. And now here's Eliezer saying, Rebecca, I want you to leave your house, I want you to leave your family, to a land that you don't know. And Rebecca shows the same spirit that Abraham showed. Yes. Yes. And apparently Rebecca took even less time than Abraham took to leave. What a, what a woman filled with the Holy Spirit is Rebecca. May all the ladies in our church be like Rebecca. On that sense, may all the guys be like Rebecca as well. What a fantastic woman. What a fantastic person. And we continue. We continue. And we see the blessing on verse 60. Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands. Great, may you multiply. They say, may you multiply. May your table be long, and may your children, may you have a child sitting on each chair, and may you not see the end of the table. Have plenty. May you, may you have a thousand, ten, ten of thousands. May your descendants be long. May your, may, may your descendants be, may they be greatly in, great in number. And may they possess the gate of those who hate them. What's the point here? Are they saying, may your descendants wage war? That's not the point. War, at that time and today, was commonplace. Was commonplace. Until today, war is extremely common. There is always a war going on somewhere. Not metaphorical, literal. There are countries that are in war right now. In civil war right now, there are countries. So war was, a, was, is, and I fear it will forever be a reality. So he, they're saying, those that try to hurt you may their hurtful intentions turn back on them. Instead of your children being the conquered, may they turn around and be the conquerors. Not that they're going to go around trying to kill other people and bullying other nations. That's not the point here. The point is, may the evil that they wish for you fall on their own heads so that you may be spared from evil. Now, and this blessing here is very similar to the blessing of chapter 22. Verse 17, when God tells Abraham, bless you, I'll bless you. 
And multiplying, I will multiply you. Now you are descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. So God is saying, Abraham, I will give you such a blessing that your children will be victorious in battle. And those who fight against them, they will lose and your children will be victorious. Now hear the same thing. Same story. How come these people are saying the same that God said to Abraham? My best guess is that God stated to Abraham a blessing that was not heard for the first time. It may have been likely that this was a common blessing stated at that time. So God took an element common to the culture and used it as his own speech, which is a very, we see that happening many different places on the entire Bible. Now we see that they departed, and there we go back to Isaac. Fantastic, man, look at this. Isaac was going to the field to meditate. Isaac was a mindful man, a man that thought about God, a man that prayed. He was going, you see, this is a very rich man. Isaac is a very, very rich man. And he did not forget God in his money. He, did not, he was not drowning gold and forgot about God. No. He took the time to go into the field and think about the Lord. To be alone. To be in solitude. Not loneliness. Solitude. Big difference. In solitude, praying and thinking about the Lord. And he was going out to the field to meditate. In the evening, so I suppose because it's no longer hot outside. And then the camels were coming. Rebecca asks, who is that man? Eliezer says, oh, that's my master. So that, that's, that's your husband. That's the guy that you're going to marry in a few minutes. And we see she steps down. She covers herself. We see that she shows all the, all the class. What a classy lady. She goes, she follows the protocol of the time. She covers herself and she want to appear as a, as a first gift. As a gift that is being given for the first time. Which was the case, of course. To her husband. Which I believe has to do with how we have weddings until today. The, the lady has the veil. The idea that is, from now on, I'm no longer covered towards you. From now on, I can be, I'm fully yours. You can see me in all the senses possible. Uh, I, I'm 100% yours. There's no veil between us anymore. I'm, I'm unveiling myself for you. So our relationship is different than my relationship to the rest of society. So that, that's the imagery there. On that case, it was quite literal. So she, she covered herself, followed the protocol, and then they meet. How many times have they, had, they spoken before? He did not know if her toenails looked good. He did not know the, her favorite color. He did, she did not know if his voice was nice or ugly. He did not know if that man was good in math and poor in geography. They knew nothing. They knew perhaps each other's names. No, she knew his name. He, he knew nothing. Short, tall, fat, thin, thick voice, thin voice, thin voice, nothing, nothing, nothing. And the Bible says that he took her into his mother's tent. Now, mother's tent, I believe that she, Rebecca was long dead. Sarah. Sarah was long dead at this time. Long dead at this time. But it still says her mother's, his mother's tent. I believe the point here is that he inherited the tent, the main tent, the main home from his mother. He could be, I'm not sure Abraham and, 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 and Sarah were at this time, were always living on the same tent. Maybe they had different tents. I don't know. I don't know the custom of the time. So I think the idea here is that he inherited his mother's tent, which of course would have been one of the better tents, maybe large, large as this building you can imagine, um, 
which would be the best one. So he inherited that. So he took Rebekah into his mother's tent, which was most likely now his tent, and he pursued her. He, he possessed her at that moment. And the Bible says she became his wife and he loved her. Simple like that. Now, I don't know if this was an immediate event or if they had a whole wedding planned or if they, they, he took her and had a conversation with her and waited until the wedding ceremony was done. The point is, they were married. They were to each other before love began. Nowadays, we believe that, oh, you must love and then marry. At that time, they said, you marry and then you must love. Nowadays, we say, you must love and then you get married. If the love dies, so does the marriage. At that time, they said, no, you marry and then you must love. And if you don't love, well, you work on it until you love it. Because you're not living. If I had to choose between either or, if I had to, oh, I have no doubt which one I would choose. Marriage is a commitment. Marriage is a commitment. And when you work on it, when you work on it, oh yes, oh yeah. how many hundreds of stories have we all heard of people that ended up hating each other and then they worked on their marriage and they say, we have the best marriage, we, could, we, we have a marriage today that we could never imagine it could be this good. How many stories do you know like that? Now let me bring this sermon to its end with three points. Number one, who, which one came first? God's reply or Eliezer's petition? Which one comes first, our prayer or God's action? I think this is the same as asking which one came first, the egg or the chicken. When God wants to act, he causes his people to pray. That is true. But when his people pray, God acts. That's also true. So which one comes first? I don't know. I know that we should pray. I know that you and I must pray. Number two, God is present in natural occasions as much as he is present in supernatural occasions. Natural events can display God's glory, just like supernatural events. And last one. But, so therefore, learn to see the Lord in your daily life. Many Christians, they feel frustrated because they never saw an angel or never saw a miracle before their eyes. So what? So what? Eliezer saw nothing and yet was overjoyed with God's provision. And lastly, a Christian must seek the Christ-like character that we saw exemplified in Eliezer and Rebekah. Eliezer, we see in Eliezer if not Eliezer, the Abraham's eldest servant, the wisdom of Christ. And we see in Rebekah the work ethic of Christ, the willingness to obey and to follow God's lead that we saw in Christ. Christ much more, of course. So we ought, these are examples on the Bible of regular people like you and I that showed a Christ-like character. May we have the same. Let us pray. Blessed be your holy name, O Lord God Almighty. You are great, you are kind, you are most wonderful, you are most perfect. Hallelujah. O Lord, give us more of Christ. May we have his character. May, 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 may we be ready and eager to say yes. Despite opposite feelings in ourselves or in others. May we be eager to say yes to the Lord. Oh Lord, we, well that's not a petition that we make, just, just from the lips out. Oh Lord, 
that's a desire of our heart that we may be shaped into the kind of people that love you so profoundly. Oh Lord, move us in our innermost parts. Move us to worship you, to obey you, and to be Christ-like in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, once again, for the tithings and offerings, uh, expect that the business committee will provide uh, uh, instructions on how we can send our tithings and offerings throughout this time of, that we are not gathering. Uh, I ask that the business committee take care of that and, and send people instructions on how to perform these transactions. Let us, let us open our, on your case at home, if you have one of these, the Psalter. Otherwise, let us just go to the book of Psalms on chapter 23. Let us read the 23rd Psalm. If you, can, if you want to sing at home, please, by all means, sing the Psalm. So let me read now Psalm number 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me the quiet waters by. My soul he doth restore again, and me to walk doth make. Within the paths of righteousness, even for his own name's sake. Yea, though I walk in death's dark valley, veil, Yet I will fear none ill, for thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff me comfort still. My table thou hast furnished in presence of my foes, my head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me, and in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. Receive the blessing of the Lord and may we enjoy this day and the Lord's day with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you.